Yes, thanks for turning up in these numbers. It looks like it's um, a topic that's very dear to some people's hearts. Which of you are, which of you earn the money with advertising? All right. So this is this um, this nest of wasps that everyone is talking about. Today we want to talk about um, cyber advertising and what its impact on our systems is. The idea that we should um, think about this topic well, came when uh, the Bild Tabloid, so the most popular tabloid newspaper in Germany, started blocking ad blockers. And their reasons for it may well be legitimate. But there are people who don't use ad blockers to to um, block all these annoying moving pictures, but also to block malware. And because this topic has never been brought up properly, we're going to do it now. We've heard quite a lot about malvertising campaigns in uh, recent days. So luckily, we don't have to talk about it theoretically because it's been proven how um, ad networks can be used to distribute malware. We want to focus mainly on why we need ad blockers to protect ourselves from malware that's distributed via ad networks. So what's the deal with ad blockers today? It's been so interestingly terrible that I've written an article about it, about um, the war between ad blockers and ad blocker blockers. Um, and uh, this article only appeared in print because if we publish it online, we're going to increase the ad blocker quota and that's going to cost us money. And they're probably right, actually. This is what the numbers look like. They're probably high now in Germany. In Germany, we have 25% ad, blocker, ad blockers on average. And if we look at the numbers of the m most frequently installed Chrome plugins that um, are available in this um, in this area, the, their numbers are above 10 million. And the least well-known ad blocker, uBlock Origin, ha um, is at 3 million only for Chrome. So the, the people are fed up with advertising. That's very obvious. It's, they're fed up with being tracked. They're fed up with no longer finding the content on the website for all the ads. But most of them don't know that they're getting rid of a massive risk by doing this as well. So let's start with a quick excursion into how ads get into our browsers. As far as we can see, the online ad system works the, in that there are three big networks. <coughs> the big uh, companies to, to um, supply ads are DoubleClick by Google, AdTech, which used to be AOL, and in Europe, there's Smart Ad Server, which is also fairly large. And these companies um, throw their ad content into a content distribution network. <laughs> well, I wouldn't call it content. Well, some may regard it as art. I mean, we we created content as well and put into this these CDNs, but we're going to talk about this about it later. But these ad servers then ensure that um, their, that their ads, which are written in JavaScript and HTML or Flash, are, appear on the websites. And it's important to know that the entire technology that is behind these ad servers and ad networks is the same everywhere. It doesn't matter if we talk about ads on websites or ads on mobile phones or in apps like ICQ, that still exists, and YouTube, which also shows ads, but all of these um, base themselves on the same technology. So who pays for it? The um, 
the unit in which these are charged is uh, per thousand views. So, one thousand views is a typical typical unit for, for charging for ads. It depends. The price depends very much on how targeted the ads are. Um, and we're seeing this becoming replaced by pay-per-click so that um, the advertisers only pay when you actually click the ad because there are so many ways to cheat the system by writing a bot that clicks your ads. And of course there are systems that um, try to recognize these, um, these try, try to identify these synthetic clicks and Many companies try to make this make this whole network of ad supplies and ad displays more measure, measurable and um, earn quite a lot of money in the process. The most important marketplaces where content is auctioned off. Um, what what do they look like? It's um, not too big, actually. Uh, so if you walk into walk into Prenzlauer Berg or Mitte into one of the their back alleys and see some logo from a from some start startup that you've never seen, it's probably on this slide. And a lot of work is shared within this network. So some companies specialize in mobile networks, some special in testing. Then at the bottom you see the data platforms and targeting platforms. And there are companies that specialize in, in very, very small aspects of these to take to have a tiny slice of this massive pie. And um, what this means is that the, peop the people who own the websites where the ads are going to appear on receive about 50% of the money that the advertisers spend. And um, the rest of that money just stays in this swamp somewhere. So which are the ad, ad platforms? It's mainly still web browsers today, and this is what we're going to focus on for, for now. Because there is one browser for a huge amount of platforms, it's very simple because we have the same client on OS X, Linux, and Windows. We're going to use Firefox as an example. And the, the apps that are built today is are usually being built in JavaScript. And they're usually built on some standards, or sometimes Flash, which is uh, still being supported by a lot of plat uh, platforms. But in the case of JavaScript-based ads, <coughs> or JavaScript-based malware, um, there's not a whole lot you have to have to adjust. It simply works out of the pl uh, out of the box on a lot of platforms and on mobile platforms as well. And mobile devices like Android and iPhones are becoming um, more and more being targeted by advertisers. We're still not seeing a lot of that, but it's becoming becoming more and more. And um, there's an interesting attack ve attack vector here because it's it's a slightly smaller because the manufacturers are um, of mobile phones are locking down devices quite a bit more than uh, it's the case for desktop computers. This doesn't mean that everything's great, but let's let's stay with web browsers. I want to talk a bit more about the technical side of things. Why is it a problem that um, malware is being distributed through ad, netwo ad networks? A web browser is a massive software project. It's become very complex. It's almost as complex as operating, sy operating systems. We have a universal tool that um, uses standards uh, from the World Wide Web Consortium to uh, work the same on all platforms. And we're not using them only to 
uh, browse the web, but also to read our email and uh, calendars to encrypt things. And uh, Google Docs or Microsoft Office, um, uh, or CMS for um, blogs and things offer you the, the capability to edit uh, documents. We use browsers to watch videos and to listen to music or to watch streams from some conferences and lots of other things. So we have a huge amount of, of things that we can use uh, browsers for and browsers are becoming the tool of choice in ad network and enterprise solutions as well because why should they build um, standalone tools for each platform if you can use a web browser as a universal platform and it's a lot easier to port your software and in these in in enterprise software there are loads of third-party plugins to make um, phone conference to log in remotely like Citrix um, does so essentially we are using web browsers as the main interface to the digital world today and um, therefore their functionality is fairly powerful you can do, do almost anything with a web browser and this means that the attack vector for malware is also similarly large. Let's take Firefox as an example. It's like, a, it's like an operating system inside an operating system. And um, Google did similar things with Chrome OS. They're essentially building a browser, and the browser is the operating system, and that's that's enough, really. It's it's similarly complex, but what's not being implemented in browsers today are all these protection mechanisms. I mean, there are already quite a few of them inside browsers, but they're not as sophisticated as they would be in an operating system, because operating systems uh, have a have a large interest in the, in memory management, in um, user privileges, in preventing you from access other people's files to prevent you from accessing system files. So all these protection mechanisms have, are implemented in operating systems, but not in browsers. So if I'm using a browser for everything that I'm doing, both professionally and privately, and some part of that browser can, act, um, can execute uh, malicious code, then that malicious code can access all the, the other data that's um, inside the browser. So there's no separations, no sandboxing between applications like operating systems have been implementing. So essentially we need an operating system kernel that implements all these protection mechanisms and ensures that uh, one process can't reach into another process. And it gets worth, worse with extensions, because of which there are quite a few, to, um, to extend your browser's functionality. Um, if you look at them from a op from operating system point of view, they're essentially the equivalent of kernel drivers and the interfaces that these can open up is nearly everything you can do on a computer, so video, audio, all, um, all, um, all storage media, everything can be packaged into these extensions. And um, of course, there are varying contexts and um, code that is loaded from the internet can is not allowed to do things that are very close to the system. And that's a good thing. But an XPI extension is comparable to a kernel driver in operating systems. So if you if you find a bug in one of these, and can exploit that, you can control the entire system. And it's the same here. If I have a bug inside an extension, and I don't know how many extensions are um, shipped with browsers by default. So for, for instance, Adblock is simply a Firefox extension. And if there's a bug in, in Adblock Pro, then you could take control of the browser. And the problem is that browsers like Firefox um, are, um, receive quite a few, quite a few auditions, um, audits from, from experts who look for, for exploits in the browser. But browsers ex browser extensions are never part of these um, large-scale audits because few people 
even consider that there might such basic flaws in these. Uh, this means that um, if you find a weakness in one of these browsers, it's very dangerous because it essentially applies to all platforms. As a hacker who wants to exploit these um, these flaws, I don't have to have to change my code to work on on iOS or on Linux or Windows, because many of these bugs are based in on, on JavaScript. It's fairly easy to exploit them. Many of you will know this, you're sensitive to this, you don't simply download something from the from the internet or click on, on attachments that um, other people send you. But this is exactly what your browser does every day with every website you visit. Um, you're allowing ad networks to track you and they send you so much software that there are, there are huge amounts of um, external code being being executed that you never know about and to, you never find out about unless you delve into this deeper. And this is exactly why we're talking about it now, because there are some very concrete dangers. And uh, we're going to show them to you later. So um, all these JavaScript programs that are being um, downloaded from the internet and are being used to um, to exploit flaws in your browser, they come from people who you, whom you cannot trust. So for instance, um, like JavaScript Jasper, who's a brother of Photoshop Philip, who um, who's employed by by an ad network and um, builds um, ad banners or creative programmers who may use um, flaws in browsers, but not even maliciously, simply because they can. So, the bösartigen Programmierer, die euch versuchen werden, bösartigen, schadhaften JavaScript-Code unterzuschieben. So there are different kinds of programmers. The malicious people who want to sneak malicious software into your systems, and this exploitation of security flaws has to do with the entire ecosystem. Because basically there are, of course, certain security measures in these ecosystems, certain conditions, for example, how large files can be. But sidestepping these security measures can be very profitable because the moment in which I can offer an exploit to make ads so much more uh, much more viewed than I would have thought. I can exploit that. And in the end, I can talk myself just out of it by saying, oh, the intern did it wrongly. No bad intentions there. So there is a commercial drive to exploit these measures to be shown in a more prominent way, in a more colorful way, or to sidestep and avoid certain forms of app blocking. Now, malvertising is the term used for proper malware, meaning ads containing Trojans, Trojanized ads, if you will, and which is usually a combination of social engineering which means creating certain attention, using certain social ways into your system, and the exploitation of technical weaknesses. And just to inform you on the scale of the problem, these are some statistics from 2013 to 2014. And these are just critical exploits. There are, of course, a lot more weaknesses in browsers if you go to the Firefox website, there is a list of all known weaknesses in there. And there are organizations which just track weaknesses and bugs and run statistics on them. And we dig up some numbers which only deal with critical weaknesses, meaning that one request can get an attacker complete control over the browser and thus the machine. In 2013, we had 227 such weaknesses in popular browsers. And in the next year, 2014, this number grew by 
exploits pro tag. Which means almost three exploits a day were out there. And there's probably a dark field much larger out there. Exploits which might be used in and might be circulating in this advertising and malvertising scene. And those weaknesses might not even be popularly known and present in a larger number of computers. And these weaknesses are very, very effective for malvertising campaigns because you can reach people across a whole number of platforms through these popular browsers. Now, if we do not just look at critical weaknesses, but all of them, the numbers run up to thousands, all of them exploitable for a large number of, well, a whole array of mischief on your, on your computers. And the number of weaknesses in your browsers are quite, quite up there with the number of exploits that can target a common operating system out there. So, you are running through the internet with three new bugs a day under a barrage of JavaScript attacks you do not really want just by looking at ads. And this is only looking at the browsers themselves. But, of course, there are also extensions, plugins, like Java plugins, Flash, and so on, all with their own flaws and weaknesses. Many of you have probably removed Flash plugins from your browsers already. Oh, wait, show of hands. Who of you still uses Flash? Very good. Who knows someone who's still using Flash? Who knows online news portals still relying on Flash? Oh, uh, yeah, it's still quite popular out there, but we're hoping for it to die out. So the methods used to distribute malware through ads are very different based on the purpose the attacker has in mind. There is the way of the drive-by shooting, meaning that you're just trying to hit a lot of the machines, a maximum number of machines who visit the ad, and this is just what the Trojan distributors might aim for. But there are also more targeted attacks, often in industrial espionage or state-sponsored espionage, which uses specifically placed advertisements for targeting purposes, selecting the people who will be shown the manipulated ads through targeted ad networks by choosing certain IDs, certain browsers and operating systems. So if I want to spy on other industries, I am looking for administrators because if I can compromise the computer of an administrator, I can get into the network because they have a lot of privileges in the network. Leading employees are, of course, also a good target to get data, to get files, to compromise them personally and get leverage on them. Uh, <coughs> secret agencies, we know that secret agencies are using these systems that are using, they, they, that is malware being initiated through ad banners, not always through ad networks, sometimes through direct injection. But the large malware campaigns that we've read about that have been committed by state actors, they um, use all the in attack vectors that exist. And of course, mal malvertising is a very attractive one because it allows you to target certain regions and, you know, and say, I only want my ads to appear in Berlin or in the Middle East or wherever. 
And even if you if you can't target them down to uh, an individual person, I can still build a piece of malware that nobody will notice because it doesn't do anything unless it um, has ended up on the uh, on the computer I was trying to target. And the the um, programs that are, that can be executed can be um, arbitrarily complex. So um, before before spending money on targeting, I can I can simply. I can simply um, spread my, my malware as, um, as thickly as possible um, until I've reached a person I want to reach and spend a few hundred thousands. So, um, let's take a look at the malware business. The people who do these things are, are run-of-the-mill capitalists, so they um, do a, a cost use calculations and um, ad networks are perfect for this because you can filter by target groups uh, which allows you to find very attractive target groups for your um, ransomware Trojan and to only attack these. There's one thing we have to be clear about though. The ransomware that we've been reading about more are a quantum leap in the malware business because it's um, the leap from business to business where you've been exploiting computers to build bot networks, to show more ads, or um, DDoS attacks, or sometimes um, emptying a bank account. It's a shift from that to B2C, business to consumer, where you're taking money from consumers directly on a, like, um, which is a very different thing. So we're seeing a huge shift in um, the business model and the motivation of course is um, is um, is getting a lot bigger because um, the, the kind of money that you can earn from these with very conservative conversion rates so the the number of people who um, who pay to get their data back from a ransomware Trojan um, the numbers run to millions of euros per day, and that's for a, for a fairly small campaign. And um, of course, this, we're getting into into an area where where, where malware um, propagators are thinking, yeah, I, I can actually spend some money on on that. And um, the people who um, if if we target um, a more wealthy group, they're probably going to pay a bit, pay us more money, so we can pay more money to target them. So um, <laughs> they might, um, for instance, make people who read manager magazines um, make them pay more. And the people who exploit the app networks to um, to target more wealthy people can uh, very happy about this. And the people who build these exploits that can um, then be used in ad networks um, have a fairly easy business. There are already varying frameworks that you can use to at least build a prototype of a universal exploiter. What you see here is, it doesn't tell you a lot, but it, I, I simply wanted to show it to you. This is the Metasploit framework. And it has a module called Autopone, which is a module that um, downloads all known implemented exploits uh, for web browsers and plugins for Flash. It opens a web server, and as soon as a browser connects to that uh, server, each of these exploits is tried in order until one of them works. Um, and suddenly you've compromised the computer that runs the web browser. So the attacker does not even need to bother um, sending the right exploit to the right browser. They can simply use this module. It just leaves it running somewhere on the internet and waits until somebody contacts his web server. And um, the app networks allow you to do this because you can use any kind of code, HTML, JavaScript, and tell the browser to um, go to this Metasploit autopone and um, get compromised and install my malware. 
So you can build a, a banner that's being sent through an ad network um, with a bit of jad, uh, JavaScript behind it. And this makes your computer talk to another computer that's going to try automatically to hack your computer. And I don't know how you feel, but I, I often have second thoughts before I click somewhere on the internet. I always wonder, is my, you know, am I using the latest version of my web browser? Am I using, um, has it, has it got all the patches it's need, it needs? This is especially a problem in enterprise networks because um, some companies don't even bother updating their, um, their software, and this means that you can use these, um, that exploiters can use these very crude exploits. And it gets worse with zero-day exploits because, I mean, it's obvious that they're a problem because you can't fix uh, a flaw that you don't know exists. It gets more difficult when uh, f software flaws become public and the software vendor does nothing to patch this flaw or it takes its, its time. There's a recent example of this where it was half a year ago, um, Apple was informed about a, a flaw in its PNG parser, the PNG images, um, and a specially prepared image was able to compromise a computer, and they knew about this flaw and took their time, and finally, uh, the person who wrote this exploit um, got, got fed up and published uh, the exploit, and I don't think Apple has bothered fixing it yet. And this is quite typical of anything that um, displays media, so pictures, videos, sound. These parsers, each of these parsers can be compromised at any given point in time in some way. So any time you open a video or 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 an image file, there's probably some way that you can exploit your browser. And um, so we don't have to simply talk about this theoretically. We thought we'd build a bit of proper ad of a, um, for, a, for an industry that's, <laughs> that's uh, underrepresented usually. So we took two exploits and um, simply dragged and dropped them to uh, some of the most popular ad networks. There's not even any, any sophisticated work needed to be done. There's no, there are no checks being done. Uh, one of the exploits we use is a real exploit. It um, concerns Firefox version 17 to 22. They're a bit older now, but I wanted to see if it's possible to uh, serve these old known exploits through ad networks. And we had a uh, second exploit against Firefox 46. But I can, um, I can reassure you that there is no flaw in, uh, in that browser. I built it in um, voluntarily. So this is, um, this is uh, 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 an example of a zero-day exploit, which I've, I've introduced um, voluntarily through, an, through, an, through a browser extension. And I'm going to demonstrate it to you now. Well, it's not like Firefox 46 doesn't have any, any real flaws, but for ethical reasons, we didn't want to, um, didn't want to do anything illegal and um, so yes, this exploit in Firefox 46 was purpose-built to demonstrate this process of, um, of zero-day exploits. So we're using a Windows virtual machine here. And you see something flash on the screen for a moment and then suddenly something happens. I want to explain what's going to happen so that we don't get any um, problems with um, any legal issues. Our exploit doesn't do anything very threatening. It, it's going to start um, the calculator app. This is a fairly common way of demonstrating flaws in, um, in hacker 
uh, like uh, amongst hackers. You simply start the calculator app, app as a proof of concept. So this is what you're going to end up seeing. And this is Firefox 46. We pushed two ad banners to uh, the ad networks. And there's a there's a large likelihood that um, you're going to see the wrong ad at first that doesn't target our browser specifically, so I'm going to have to reload a few times. So we're loading the website. You see a <laughs> You're seeing a banner for the von Leitner Institute of Distributed Real-Time Java. Uh, this is the wrong ad for this browser, so I'm going to reload the page until it shows the ad that's trying to hurt this browser. Oh, there we go, light over copper technology. This doesn't look very spectacular, but I hope it's at least proof. Uh, you can look at the HTML source code. I can, I can give you the code if you don't trust me. It's being served through one of the largest ad, ad networks in the world. And I'm going to start a different uh, virtual machine with uh, the old version of Firefox to show you how that works. And the motivation behind this experiment was to see if um, the ad networks are doing things to mitigate these exploits. And we had to, s we, we have to concede that no, they don't do anything and they don't stand a chance of doing that either because the variance between the possible malicious code that you can introduce into these ads uh, due to the programming interface that it exists and the amount of bugs that exist in browsers are so huge the typical antivirus technology simply doesn't stand a chance. And um, besides this, we got the impression that the ad networks don't really care. Um, and if these malwaretizing campaigns are going to get bigger, they're going to start pu putting band-aids on this. But they're not, not too concerned about this because they're too busy um, shoveling money. So this is Firefox 22. It um, actually has a real flaw that we're going to exploit. And we're going to try to compromise it through this ad network. This is, of course, a wrong exploit here, but um, the <laughs> von Leitner Institute is going to get, pop up the calculator again. So this could be your crypto trojan instead of the calculator app. So I'm going to go back to my uh, to my slides now. All right, so to sum this up, we have gone through this entire list of things you have to do to distribute malvertising on the real internet. We distributed malicious JavaScript over an official large ADN. We exploited a browser bug with JavaScript to load a software, an executable from the internet um, to save it locally and run it on the machine, which is quite common practice because you can modify this executable on a day-to-day -day basis if antivirus softwares update the definitions to catch you. And, well, instead of this demonstration, you can think of anything that might be here. It could be state-sponsored Trojan, it could be ransomware, whatever. No, this is not just great theory. Here's an overview of a few headlines from the last weeks. Pirate Bay was hit by malvertising and distributed server ransomware to users surfing to the site. 
There were malvertising ads on with uh, Let's Encrypt certificate. The websites of AOL, BBC, MSN were made to distribute ransomware. And even dated Android devices, which are still out there in the market very, very much, have been hit by malvertising over the Internet. We could expand this list and go on forever and ever. The statistics speak for themselves. And the companies looking at this tell us about um, constantly 600 to 1,000 websites delivering malvertising. And in a recent case in Switzerland, we didn't see that. We, see, we, saw, we saw that attackers didn't even resort to using malvertising. They slipped their code directly into the newspaper CDN. Which brings us to the question, what do we do about this situation? As we see a large number of you in the audience is in some way dependent on or earning the money with advertising, which means that ad blocking does hit <coughs> this sector very much. But from a security perspective, I have to tell you that the first thing you have to do to protect your system, aside from not clicking executables and emails, is install an ad blocker. So, well, this might not really fit well into the what to do section of this talk, but maybe it does. So we got a few statistics on the requests happening on the websites of newspapers in Germany, meaning that if I visit Bild.de, I don't just see the landing page there, but um, your web browser gets a lot of scripts, of images, and other things from the internet and runs them all. So we click three to four articles on those different news pages as a ballpark value, looked into a few sections there, and we received, we noted 2,339 requests on Bild.de all over the course of just two minutes, and there's no way you can know who your web browser is even talking to in that time. 2,500 requests on Spiegel Online, and we looked over the logs and extracted the real server names to see where external data was downloaded from. And if you build a list of unique hosts, we find that there are 195 servers contacted when you click on Bild.de. And the funny thing is that the servers actually belonging to Bild.de are just 13 of 195 contacted in total. Which leaves 182 content delivering third party hosts which are not under the control over of, um, of the news page in question. So here's a table of all those numbers, and in the end, those major newspapers have between 9 and 13 hosts under their control and between 113 and 182 third-party hosts completely outside of their control are contacted when you visit, which means that, be it newspapers or blogs, all those pages only have the name on it and the content, tracking pixels, ads, third-party content, everything that is served to your web browser 
is not even under the technical control of those sites anymore, which means that you are under an illusion here. You click a website run by, well, a trustworthy organization, and this brand builds trust because, of course, you would think that I can trust this, there won't be anything bad happening to my machine on here, but actually 90% of the requests, 90% of the hosts contacted on this page are run by third parties, and your machine can just get infected by loading JavaScript. Frank just mentioned um, 20 Minuten from Switzerland, which had malicious code slipped into their own CDN. And this can happen from any one of those many hosts involved in visiting a news website just as well. So what you do? Our appeal to news pages is try to get control over your pages back. Try not to just create the illusion for the user that they are visiting your page, but actually take care that they are not getting content from everywhere else in the world. Try not to use Flash, Silverlight, or Java plugins that force users to install these plugins with their own weaknesses and flaws. They just need to be dropped from the market. They are done. A browser making use of HTML5 is complex in its own right, so you do not have to invite even further, even more flaws by making use of plugins. Make use of the features the browser brings natively and do not shift responsibility for the security of your readers' machines to the readers themselves, because you cannot just call on users to install antivirus software or to install an intrusion prevention system at the front of your enterprise system, because all those things do are prevent regular HTTP sites from loading. And that's not a problem because HTTPS or TLS secured transmissions can just as well be infected by malvertising. And um, encryption is often used as a, you know, often people say that using encryption nothing can happen, but it's bullshit because um, many, the exploit me extension we built for this was signed by Mozilla. Um, so it's essentially a rootkit that I built into the browser and it was, it got signed by Mozilla, so that tells you about the security of that. So what can you do if you're a content um, publisher? If you cannot guarantee that um, untrusted JavaScript is uh, served to your clients, then you have to allow ad blockers. If, you ha if you're using an ad network service, um, ask them about security and insist what, you know, ask persistently what kind of um, guarantees it can give you and uh, what happens if one of your readers um, is served uh, malware through your network? Who's liable? Is that you as a content distributor? Is that the ad network? And they, you know, only if they can be held liable for this, they may, we may start to see them um, watching what they serve, and otherwise nothing is going to happen. Um, because essentially what an ad network is, it, it's, used, it's got the same liabilities, the same duties as an app store. And app stores are um, checking, you know, if the software is malicious and if, if what they're serving is legitimate, and ad networks are not doing that, even though they're very similar. But we're not going to see any change unless there's significant pressure. And um, just to make this clear, the damage in reputation if your website serves malware to your customers is not going to go to the app network, it's going to you because 
your reputation is being damaged because your readers don't know about the ad network. Um, so your readers are going to say, oh, I got the, the malware from, from your news website and not from the ad network, even though that may not be the case. Uh, try to limit what um, an ad network distributor can do on your website. You've got no control on the on the number of requests that the reader's browser is going to fire out. So try to define some very clear rules. Try to avoid dynamic content so that nothing can be um, loaded um, can be can can be loaded on the fly. The, the best thing you can do is to limit your ads to static images, um, and uh, then your browsers can only can only be um, can only be compromised by exploits in image parsers. Explain to your users what kind of um, advertising you're allowing on your website and and why. Then a bit of transparency can't hurt to um, to establish some trust amongst your readers. Because um, some people may may come up to you and say, uh, or come up to the advertising networks and say, no, this is not really what we want. Um, please start fixing this, and you may prof uh, profit in the in the process. And one of the massive questions that the media are facing these days is what the alternatives might look like, especially in the area of payments. And I've been thinking about this for a long time. And what always surprises me is um, the things that come up when you talk about the price that would be reasonable for an article, in, like for a news article in a um, in micropayment. Now we've got Blender these days, where a news article costs between 25 and 20, uh, 75 cents for an article, and I always wonder, ah, 75 cents for an article, and the whole magazine costs a few euros. That's not really fair. So what would be a fair price? It's not 25 cents for most readers. A fair price, a market price for a, for a news article. Um, the price you might get on the market these days is the number of users without ad blockers and the the money you earn from a from an article and we're in single digits of cent amounts here um, but there is a there are people who who would be prepared to pay for for news articles certainly, certainly not all of them but um, people are prepared to pay um, but it has to be unique content. It has to be content that um, that people are willing to to pay for, and it it cannot be so expensive that it it starts to hurt, and um, it cannot be expensive to pay for. It, it can be difficult to pay for. So simply as a as a vision, I mean, you're allowed to dream, right? What would be uh, Content Payment Cooperative. I think we need a micropayment system where the people running the system don't have a commercial interest in the system. And anybody who uh, distributes content can become a member of this uh, cooperative. So anyone wants to have pay content, they only need to log in once they have one payment relationship and the the, um, the vendor itself has no commercial interest. Um, you can do individual tracking to um, to charge per use. Some modern cryptography lets you, lets you do it. And the threshold for payments, which is always a problem because you have to log in and um, fill in your credit card details, that would only exist once and um, then all of all others could benefit. Mm, but a cooperative, doesn't that sound a bit, doesn't that sound a bit old fashioned, you know, 20s building cooperatives sort of 
But no, these things exist in, uh, in the modern world. Many people may not know about this, but the DPR, the German press agency, is de facto uh, a cooperative of German news publishers. And each, um, each of the publishing companies only owns a very small share in this cooperative, and it's being run by all the uh, publishing companies together. And there's no reason why, why publishers could not build a payment model where we don't have to track users and um, we can all benefit from without um, stepping on each other's, feet, each other's feet. There are many reasons why this may not work right now, but we're going to have to get there eventually because the share of people using ad blockers is going to increase. And if the media industry wants to keep existing, they have to think of something that fetches users from where they are now. And um, this brings us to the end of our talk. And Frank just uh, was just talking about this. The media that, are, that finance themselves through advertising, they have to start thinking about alternative ways of financing their content because advertising, and I hope that we were able to explain this um, in, a, in a reasonable way today, um, has, has simply grown out of hand. We can no longer protect, protect ourselves against um, malicious content if we're no longer allowed to block advertising. We have a small analogy as well. You as um, content publishers who are finance themselves through advertising, decide that your readers must um, submit themselves to a certain security risk and you have to get rid of that. It's as if a funeral company um, owned a, a small part of, uh, of the motorway and said this, this part of the motorway must only be used without airbags. This is kind of an analogy that you may help you think about it, although of course it's, it's um, not quite the same. But um, our time's up, unfortunately. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much for uh, Stefan Urbach, who helped us a lot, and thank you for your attention.